The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. I'm Connie Potter, co-producer of The Big Bang Stage and co-founder of The Big Bang Collective. What you just saw was a snippet of what you can catch tomorrow night live, a DJ set done by Larry Lee, a physicist from Harvard, and Kaleidoscope Music. That's also on The Big Bang Stage program. Welcome to the biggest physics conference of the year, and welcome to the very special program we've put together for you today and tomorrow, sharing the excitement, importance, passion, and fun of science. So let's get the show started. In the lovely Swiss city of Geneva, right where it meets the French border in the beautiful countryside was where some wise individuals decided over 60 years ago to build what would become one of, if not the most prestigious, unique and exceptional scientific organizations in the world known as CERN. Fast forward to 2020 with 23 member states, eight associate member states, six observer states and after several Nobel Prizes, expansion over the border to France and incredible feats of engineering, a community of over 10,000 physicists, engineers, technicians and administrative specialists bring life to the CERN community, sometimes at CERN itself, sometimes in their home institutes and universities, but they all come together in peaceful pursuit of their scientific knowledge. Today, kicking off the prestigious ICHEP 2020 Big Bang stage, we are delighted to take you live to CERN, deep underground to visit one of those feats of engineering, the Atlas experiment. Our guides, Clara Nellist, a Radboud Excellence Initiative Fellow in the Netherlands and an active science communicator, and Mohamed al Roub with the University of Oklahoma and master of the hugely successful Atlas Virtual Visits Programme, We'll spend the next 30 minutes taking you to places you can't normally see and then answering live any questions you have. Go to the link just beneath our screen here to click on the Slido and type in your questions. Hello, Clara and Mohammed, are you there? Hi, Connie, uh, we're here, can you see us? Hi, Connie. So, hi, Connie. Hello. We can hear you clear, uh, loud and clear. Uh, yeah, excellent. So, uh, hi, my name is Clara Nellis. So thank you so much, Connie, for the lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, Mohammed and I are both particle physicists on the Atlas experiment. And first, just to say, we're really sorry if it's too noisy here. This is an active lab. Um, so there is currently a lot of construction work, upgrades, uh, improvements happening. Um, but we're going to show you the Atlas detector. So we can, we will listen. Okay, so we start from the ninth uh, floor, which is uh, minus 65 meters, or let's say 65 meters below the surface. And maybe Clara can show you the shaft. And right now we are on top of the Atlas uh, detector, which is a huge, a huge detector, 50 meters long by 27 meters in diameter and it weighs 7,000 tons. It's one of the four big experiments uh, around the LHC. And uh, it's, let's say, the, our eyes, uh, it's like uh, our eyes of the LHC. So it's one of the main experiments. We have Atlas, CMS, we have ALICE and LHCB. It's a, main, a, ge a general purpose detector made from many sub detectors concentric layers, we have the specialized sub-detectors and we will go through them one by one. But uh, after the introduction, so we will go to level four, then six, two, 
and we will show you the other side of the detector and also when uh, the, the side of the detector, the other side. We will speak about the physics program and of course the com uh, components of the detector and maybe the engineering complexity. Maybe Clara wants to say something? Yeah, so we uh, switch our tech. So if you hold it. So uh, as Mohammed was saying, um, so we are, well, we're about 100 meters underground. Um, but as you can see, if I point Mohammed up this way, this is the access shaft that allowed us to build this detector uh, in the cavern. So you can think of it like a ship in a bottle. It wasn't possible to construct the Atlas detector above ground and then lower it down in one piece. We had to um, build separate components, different specialized technology to do all of the um, measurements that we needed to be done with the Atlas detector. And then we lowered them down piece by piece um, and constructed them here in the cavern over many, many years. Um, and so you can just, you can see now from the video just how complicated the construction is. Uh, we, we have many different uh, layers, as Mohammed was saying, to do uh, different parts. And as I said at the beginning, this is an active work site. We have people currently um, working down here uh, with all full uh, protective measures to ensure that it's safe to do so. So we're, yeah, as, as Connie was saying that we will take questions at the end, um, but we wanna give you a, a tour of this, uh, of this cavern um, and it's, it's huge. So in a moment, we're gonna go on a walk and we're gonna give you an idea of just how, how big this cavern is. Um, you want to add more up here or? I think we can go to the eighth floor and uh, start uh, speaking about the muni spectrometer. Yeah, the can you, outer... can you tell us what the, these are very famous. Yes, uh, those are the toroid magnets. So we have two magnetic systems, in the, uh, the solenoid magnet, which surrounds the inner detector. It produces two Tesla of magnetic field. And the solenoid magnet is a superconducting ma ma magnet. And it runs at extremely low temperature, 1.9 Kelvin, or uh, let's say minus 271 degrees centigrade. The other system is the toroid magnets. We have eight toroid magnets, each more than 100 tons, and each can produce uh, a magnetic field between uh, two and six Tesla. Now, six Tesla is more than 60,000 times stronger than the Earth magnetic field. Now, we need the magnetic field. Yes, we need the magnetic field to force a charged particles to change their trajectories in order to measure their electric charges and their momentum. And so th those tubes with the orange strips are the uh, toroid magnets. And again, they are superconducting magnets. They run at extremely low temperature, uh, 1.9 kg. Uh, now we're going to go on a little walk. So hopefully you've had a nice view up here of uh, the top of the detector. And it's so huge and so complicated that we're really not going to be able to show you all of the inside. But we want to give you a special uh, view that you wouldn't be able to get if you came here to CERN. So this really is a behind the scenes access uh, to the Atlas detector. So you can come and visit us. And we do have a visitor's platform, not right now, unfortunately. But this point where we're standing is not where visitors can come. So it really is a special behind the scenes uh, tour. Okay, shall we march yeah. on? So Mohammed will lead the way. And I will try not to fall down the steps because I am slightly clumsy. But we'll do my, my very best. So you can see that it really requires a lot of cables uh, for cooling, for electricity, for for taking the data out. So, oh, maybe we can come over here and see it from the side. So here, if you look down here, so you should be able to see with the, the camera. So this is the muon spectrometer. So muons are the heavier cousins of the electrons. Um, they are 
the in the se- what we call the second generation of in the standard model. So they're like electrons, uh, but they're heavier. And that means that when they're created in the center of our detector, they, they don't get stuck by any other part of our detector and they travel all the way to the outside. So we have this uh, very special layer at the edge of our detector, which is specifically to measure muons. Now muons are interesting to measure because you might have seen at iChat that we released a new result, which was pigs to chew muons. And that was a really interesting result because it was the first time that we've measured the Higgs boson interacting with these particles. And to make sure that it's really the Higgs boson that we think it is, we have to measure it to all of these different types of particles. Um, so both ATLAS and CMS uh, released this new result and it, it's the first time that collectively there's evidence uh, for this result. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to walk to the sixth floor. Um, I'm sorry, that was a close up of my hand. So as we go, I'm going to give you different special views of the detector so you can just get an idea of quite how massive this detector is. So it's bigger than its cousin, uh, CMS, in LHCB and Ali. Um, each of the detectors on the LHC uh, were designed separately by different teams, and that's partly so that the results that we, uh, we share with the world are really um, verified by the different uh, detector groups, the different collaborations. So we, we design our detectors slightly differently. We do our analyses slightly differently. So Mohammed's going to tell you what these tubes are. So uh, these tubes are part of the immune sp- uh, spectrometer. And they are simply drift tubes. Uh, they are filled with gas, and in the center of each tube, we have a very thin wire. So the idea is that muons, which are charged particles, ionize the gas, and the electrons will drift to the uh, anodes. And so we have electric pulse from each tube, or let's say from the tube where the muons pass. And since we know the posi- uh, the position or the coordinates of the muon. Uh, or the tubes, we can get a point in space. And if we have activate, if sorry, if we activate more than a tube, we can make a fit and we can get the trajectory of the immune particle. And if we know the trajectory, we know the curvature. And if we know the magnetic field, we can calculate the momentum of the particle and its electric charge. The electric charge can be plus minus one. So it's very robust, simple uh, technology. We don't need the most precise uh, sub detector it's i mean the surface area is very big and it's impossible to uh, cover it with the silicon detector in addition i mean plus minus one centimeter and uh, accuracy is okay given the fact that we are far away from the collision point yeah and so knowing the momentum of the muons uh, helps us to identify the particles that they came from so this is a, a really important measurement uh, and it's a, it's a piece of identification. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle with the Atlas detector. We have lots of different detectors. They each tell us a different piece of information. And from that, the physicists can put it all together um, and work out what particle was created in the collision. So for example, it could have been a Higgs boson. It could have been a Z boson. So now we're, we're going to go alongside of the detector. Um, so it's 47 meters long, the, the detector, and it's 25 meters tall. So um, you can get some idea of just how big it is. And here, if we come along the side, then we can see the side of the muon detector. Um, so you can see those, those plates, and you can see like the tubes uh, overlap each other so that we can get accurate measurements. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're going to go for a walk along the detector. So some parts of the detector are off limits at the moment because of the construction work. So obviously safety is our primary uh, 
requirement at the moment, but well, always. Anna, do you want to do you want to mention what this is? You're pointing at it. So this is a, a part of also a toroid magnet. So as I said, we have uh, two magnetic subsystems. We have the toroid magnets, we have the solenoid, and the, the toroid magnets, we have eight uh, toroids, and, but also we have the end cap toroids. And again, we need the magnets to bend the trajectories or the, of the charged particles in order to measure their momentum and their electric charge. And since we have ultra relativistic particles, the magnets should be uh, super strong. And thus, we, I mean, we have um, superconducting magnets. And superconducting magnets with the current technology work only at extremely low temperature. We use liquid helium. And the temperature, uh, as I know, it's 1.9 Kelvin, or let's say in Celsius, it's 271 degrees centigrade. Minus, minus sorry, <laughs> minus 271 degrees yeah. centigrade. So we will. I'll, get, I'll carry this. You keep working. So these are the cooling pipes uh, because we need, uh, so as Mohammed just explained about the superconductivity, um, we need very, very cold temperatures for that. So we're walking along the, the full length of the detector now. So we have more cooling pipes here. And then here is the, we're walking alongside the detector. And this is where we, as far as we can go right now, because as you can see, it's quite open. So even though we have all of this uh, scaffolding to allow the uh, engineers and physicists to get access to the detector, you can see through the scaffolding, the other side, so the other muon chamber um, that's open up. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk back the way that we came. So maybe you want to. Floor. Yeah, and we're going to go to the fourth floor. So we started at nine. Now we're on six. Now we're going to walk to the fourth floor. And then Mohammed and I are going to split up so that we can show you two very nice views of the detector open. And as I said earlier, this is really a view that you wouldn't usually be able to see uh, if you came to CERN. But please, when everything's open up again and you happen to be in Geneva, come visit us because it is spectacular to see in person as well. Thank you very much. So, yeah, this is currently the sixth floor and the lift is not accessible at the moment, especially with two people at once. So we are walking. And you can see all of these cables, that are required to, to take this significant amount of data. So maybe Mohammed, if you come out so that we can switch places. We have to go one at a time. Yeah, so I'll show everybody. So this is where the LHC beam pipe comes. Uh, so inside that is the beam pipe from the Large Hadron Collider which sends the beam that way, but you can't see it because we've got a muon chamber in the way, uh, to collide in the center of our detector. So we're gonna keep working again. This is also the way we would leave. We needed to leave quickly, but that's not going to happen. Okay. And here, actually, I'm just gonna stop here one moment, Mohammed, because here you can see a very nice drawing of the detector, which helps you get an idea of what we've seen already. So here is the beam pipe that I was just talking about. Here are the muon chambers. Here are the magnets that Mohammed was telling you about. Uh, and what we won't really be able to see, but we're gonna try and get a look at from the platform, is just the, the layers in the center of the detector because it's, it's so complicated that well, even when it's open up, we can't always easily access uh, each area of the detector. Um, but this is to give you an overview uh, to help you understand what you're seeing in this visit. And now Mohammed will be done. Each. 
each part of the sub detector is made by a country or a research institute. For example, this toroid magnet is made in, uh, in Netherlands uh, at NICAF uh, Research Institute. Uh, other parts, for example, made in other countries like the pixel detector or, or the inner detector, the SCT, some of them in Germany, some of them in Britain, and some sub detectors made in one or two or maybe uh, three countries, like they manufacture the parts in one country. They test the parts in a second country. The testing uh, in a third country, uh, the assembly, I find the assembly in a third country. Then finally, they bring the parts, full tested parts to Atlas uh, So it's a big collaboration, more than 100, I think. Uh, yeah. So at the last count, it's 103 nationalities, 38 countries. 238, I think, uh, research institutes collaborated uh, to build this massive, uh, uh, massive detector. Yeah, so it's really a global effort. So even though we showed you one example of that happens to be the research institute that pays me, so they'll be super happy. Um, but uh, it's, it's such a global effort. I mean, the sheer number of people, we have over 5,500 5, people working on the detector and the, and the analysis and the software and all of the things that have to come together for this huge experiment to work. So yeah, it's it's um and and often people so you might hear the Atlas experiment, um, but really what we're doing is thousands and thousands of experiments using the same detector. So it's not just one thing that we want to find out and then we're done. We want to know. Is there an exposure? Yes. What kind of exposure? What does it interact with? Is there dark matter? Can we measure the top work to the best mass possible? Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to emphasize that the detector, I and mean, we do, I do physics, Clara do physics, but I mean, we need so much uh, engineering to build the detector. Oh. Okay, so she worked uh, on the detector during her PhD. Yeah, I, I did only physics. <laughs> So, I mean, as I said before, I mean, different parts of the detector built by different research institutes and some of the parts built by one or more even. So you see here three uh, countries uh, or three research uh, institutes participated to build the second um, uh, uh, toroid magnet. So we have two end cap toroid magnets, one at site A, one at site C. So, because our detector is symmetric, so what we have in one side, we have it in the other side of the detector. Okay, so this is where Mohammed and I uh, part ways for a moment. Um, so, he is going to take you downstairs so that you can look up at the detector after I have taken you upstairs to look down at it. And here, yeah, and then I will go and join him afterwards. And here is where I want everyone to cross your fingers because the point that I'm going to take you to is quite narrow and I'm going to hold my tablet over to show you the detector. So we have to cross our fingers that I don't have butter fingers and I don't drop the tablet. So now we are at the other side of the detector. So here again, you can see these muon drift tubes. Um, so we walked the full length of the detector while we were talking to you, and now go through this orange gateway. Okay. So it's a bit noisier here as well, so hopefully you can hear me, but here is the view that I wanted to show you from this angle. So here is the Atlas detector from this side. And what you can see in the center here are the colorimeters. So the colorimeters measure the energy of particles as they're passing through. And we want to know the energy because again, it helps us identify what kinds of particles were created in the proton-proton collisions or in the photon-photon collisions, peripheral interactions which we also released some very nice results about at iChat this week. So you can also go on the Atlas Detector website and uh, read all about those very interesting results. 
And again, here we have another chef. I'm going to try very hard not to drop anything so that we can lower things down on this side of the detector to construct it. And if our lovely pet guy can maybe switch to Mohammed, who is down here, and then Hi, Clara. there we go, excellent. Yes, so I am uh, the second floor, which means minus 90 meters. And on the other side of the video, actually the same side as you. And I have a uh, full view of the immune spectrometer, but from the other side, as you see, it's a huge wheel. And its purpose is to uh, measure the price of immune particles. Currently, they are installing a small immune wheel. And if we look there, we see uh, droid magnets, we see the calorimeter. Uh, hydronic calorimeter. So we have actually two calorimeters, one to measure the energy of electrons and photons. We call it electromagnetic calorimeter. Sometimes we call it liquid argon calorimeter. The other one is the hydronic uh, calorimeter, and it's a sub detector uh, to measure the energy of hadrons. Hadrons is a family of particles made from quarks and gluons. For example, protons, the neutrons, the nuclei of all atoms uh, belong to the family of hadrons. Currently, we can see the innermost part of the detector, the inner detector, the pixel, the semiconductor tracker, and um, the TRT, because the detector is, uh, is closed. But what we can see is the, the size and the shaft of the detector, and we see it's huge, really huge, 25 to 27 meters in diameter. And if you look there, I mean, you see it's very long, around 50 meters long. We can walk you through uh, this uh, side, but I'm not sure we can see so much. This part, I mean, is again uh, immune spectrometer, but it's different technology from the end cap immune spectrometer. This is the central part. I mean, again, the idea is to measure uh, threats of immune particles, and it's the, uh, the outermost uh, sub detector. And since the detector is closed, again, we can't see so much uh, in. Okay, so I went back to the side A. We started upstairs there, uh, floor uh, 10. We went down to six, then four. Then at four, me and Clara split. She went to six, I went down to two. And now she just joined me. I go back to here. Yeah, so now I'm back uh, down on the second floor with Mohammed. And you can see me there. Uh, Hi, Clara. Hey. <laughs> Great. So we have given you a, a view of the Atlas detector um, from many different angles, and we really hope that you've enjoyed this. And uh, now we're going to hand back over to Connie, who's hopefully got some questions for us uh, from this tour. Or just generally, do you want to know more about? what we're working on in Atlas and things like that. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Clara and Mohammed. I'm not sure how many kilometers you must be walking, going up and down, up and down, all over the place there. Has anybody got a Fitbit that can tell us? Uh, I can tell you how many steps. Uh, Pretty impressive. Some beautiful shots of Atlas there, absolutely beautiful. I do have some questions. I've actually got quite a few questions. Um, I'm gonna go straight in with one here. Um, is it dangerous to work there if you're actually working on the detector? Um, I'm talking in terms of harmful radiation present in the cavern. So, I mean, that is a good question um, because, uh, oh, let me press the button without knocking the tablet. It is a very good question because we do deal with radiation. And so what you might notice is that Mohammed and I both have these dosimeters, um, which keep track of the radiation that we might receive while we're working. Um, but for example, I uh, did my PhD on the pixel detectors. Uh, so the short answer is yes and no, because there is some radiation and there are dangers, but CERN is so uh, supportive and careful about its staff that it would not let anybody work in an environment that was actually dangerous to them. So we have these dosimeters which measure our uh, radiation dosage. When I was working on the pixel detectors, um, we wanted to test how long they would last 
in, in our atlas detector. And so we would irradiate them intentionally because that damages them and then see how that damage like, uh, affected their performance. And for doing that for four years, five years, um, my, my dosimeter never really went above background. So we were super careful. Um, and also, when the LHC is running, we cannot be down here. So there is a lot of radiation then, but we cannot be in the, in the cabin. We can't be in the LHC uh, tunnel. So we have to be aware of, of the dangers. But for example, above ground, there's absolutely no uh, measurable radiation. It's, it's uh, all kept underground and very well insulated. Uh, do you want to add anything? Yes, I have to add that right now we have uh, less radiation than uh, the radiation people receive above uh, the ground because we are covered by 100 meters of the air. So, so much air to protection from the cosmic rays. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, so everybody gets radiation every day anyway, and some of it comes from uh, the cosmic rays that come from, from space and interact with our atmosphere. It's why the northern lights are so beautiful because this is the, the interaction of these particles with our ionosphere. Um, but as Mohammed just said, we are under, we're 100 meters underground. Um, so we're really uh, getting less radiation down here than we would get on, on the surface. So that, that's a bonus. <laughs> Something you said just now, Clara, made me think, what has an organization like CERN with so many moving pieces, so many um, big uh, sensitive devices, how has that been operating during the worldwide lockdown that we've been experiencing? Yeah, this, this is a good question as well, because um, it, it's obviously a lot of places had to shut down. Um, and so goods, for example, couldn't necessarily be transferred from the different sites. Um, but CERN prioritizes the health and safety of the staff and the people working on site absolutely first. Um, so you can see that Mohammed and I are also in personal protective gear for the, for the virus. Um, and so the, the first priority was to make sure everybody is safe. And then afterwards, if it's possible to, for people to work in their labs or for equipment to be shipped, then that was considered. Um, but it has, it has caused some delays. Um, but that's something, you know, there's so much going on this year that we, can, we consider ourselves very lucky um, that we can even, for example, show you this today uh, in this way. Um, so we, we try our best, but obviously health and safety and also, you know, health and safety of others as well is such a priority. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a question on the physics. Um, a question here from the slide. What do you think... What kind of breakthrough can we expect, if we can, in the near future in particle physics? Good question. If you know, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we, what, what kind of breakthroughs can we expect? I mean, we're doing a lot of precision measurements at, at CERN. So, for example, when the Large Hadron Collider, which collides protons, which have quarks inside of them, uh, so it's a very messy collision, it wasn't necessarily thought that it could be this really precise uh, experiment. So uh, we, we were looking for the Higgs boson, um, which is, was discovered through the sheer amount of data we collected. And that's one of the benefits of a Hadron Collider and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, but actually, physicists have been coming up with really, in, in, really clever ways of um, of doing these precision measurements that it wasn't previously thought possible. So one of the results that Atlas has just released uh, is looking at uh, lepton flavor universality. And this is uh, a study that's looking at whether electrons, muons, and tails are produced in the same rate, which is what we expect. And the previous accelerator at CERN, LEP, uh, measured a small deviation that was kind of interesting because maybe there would be new physics there. Uh, and it wasn't expected that this measurement could be retested at CERN, but it, it was. And we've got a result out now that is better than the LEP result. So these precision measurements are really important for testing the standard model, because when you have a, a theory such as the standard model, you want to test it as much as possible and see if there's any, any changes to what you expect. 
But then we're also looking for dark matter. We're looking for new physics. And so we have a lot of different analyses um, where, uh, for example, we're looking for missing momentum. So this is where a particle is created in our detector that could be dark matter, we don't know. Um, and it doesn't leave a trace in our detector, but we can tell that it's there because there's a lot of stuff going in the other direction. Um, and so this could be a hint of dark matter or new physics. And if we find it, that would be fantastic. Um, so we're, we're doing both these precision measurements and these uh, searches for new kinds of physics in different ways. I don't know if you want to add on top of that. I mean, no, I can say that we are looking for the unknowns. I mean, that's the fun part. I mean, yes, if we find what we expect, okay, great. We will be happy and thrilled. But it's more exciting to look at the data and find something we didn't expect, or neither us nor theoreticians. And then, I mean, of course, we and theoreticians will be more excited because they have so much uh, job to explain the uh, things we will find. Uh, we need both, I mean. We need to falsify the standard model uh, theory of particle physics. Uh, I mean, that's the only way to find the new things. We have so many open questions. We need to answer them all if possible. And we have so many predictions by theoreticians, but it is not, I mean, maybe none of the predictions is correct. Maybe we have to go back to the drawing board and write a new theory. We don't know. And so that's the fun from my uh, point of view. Maybe I, uh, Clara agrees. Yeah. I'm sure she agrees with that. I, I agree. And we're also coming up with new techniques to test the data that we've already collected. So for example, we have huge amounts of data that we collect from this massive machine. And we have been looking at it uh, through the theories that have already been thought up by theorists. But every day, theorists come up with new and different ways to test our data. Uh, and we have machine learning uh, developments. That means we can really dig into uh, this data in more details and, and learn about it in different ways. So it's not just about, it's, it's about looking into what we already have and, and trying to see if there's, there's new physics in there as well. And one of the examples about the Higgs boson, one of the descriptions was it wasn't looking for a needle in a haystack. It was looking for a needle in a, in a pile of needles. So it's, uh, you're, you're looking for something that, that looks very similar to the other data. And so it's really very complicated to try and find something new in all of that, all of that data. It sounds like a journey into the unknown. It sounds yeah, like exactly. Um, going back to our questions, there are more and more coming in here. Um, what is the main part of Atlas and its working mechanism? Oh, main, main part of Atlas. I mean, I mean, <laughs> It really depends on who you ask, because everybody who's worked on the detector has a different bias. So the people that build this detector are so, get so attached to their part. So if you ask me, I'm going to say the pixel detector, because that's what I worked on. And it's, it's so important for, um, so if we want to study top quarks, we need to uh, see, because top quarks almost always change into a W boson and, and a B quark. And the interesting thing about B quarks is that they travel a little distance before they then change into other particles. And that little distance is not quite that big, about this big, uh, on, depending on uh, statistics. Um, the distance that they travel means that we can use the pixel detector, which is this tracking detector at the very heart of Atlas, to identify them. And so it's a really important part of the detector. But that wouldn't be good enough on its own. We also need the other segments of the tracking detector. We need the calorimeters to measure energy. We need the muon uh, spectrometer to identify muons. We need the magnets to, to bend the particles. So I think it's really impossible to say one part that is, is key because without it, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to add up all these individual pieces of information. But depending on who you ask, someone will always have a favorite. A favorite part. What's your favorite part, Mohammed, of the Atlas detector? Actually, in my, in my analysis, I used all parts because I used uh, electrons, I used the muons, I used the jets, I used the hadronic jets. Currently, I'm using photons. 
So the good data for my analysis is the data collected by all Atlas subdetectors. And the magnets, of course, should be running. Uh, so most of the analysis depends on all subdetectors. Rarely, I'm, I'm, I can't remember any analysis that re uh, relies on a single subdetector. Maybe there are, but I am not aware of. I heard once that um, when you close everything up in the cavern um, and you start turning the detector on in the magnetic fields, any little screw or piece of metal or anything that's around metallic goes flying around everywhere and could potentially damage the machine. So you do an absolutely incredibly thorough cleaning each time before closing up the cavern. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the yes. very, you want to go? Oh, okay, so yes, I mean, if we have a screw or a nail and it's ferromagnet, made from ferromagnetic material and we have a very strong magnet, six Tesla. So that nail can travel like a bullet and can puncture the subdetectors and can cause serious damage. So yes, people, you find postdoctors, even professors, PhD students, checking every part, counting them piece by uh, centimeter by centimeter. Otherwise, I mean, it can seriously harm the detector, or maybe we are unfortunate, um, hopefully not. Maybe if, actually no, no one should be allowed to go underground while it's running. So, I mean, from the human um, perspective, we are safe, but also we have to care about the safety of the detector. It costs millions and it costs time and years and decades to design and build it, and we should not lose it or lose a big part of it because of a silly mistake. Uh, I now have um, visions of professors and Nobel Prizes going around with a dustpan and brush just before you uh, turn on the machine. I think that's great. Such a collaboration. So we've got several questions from potential physicists, it would seem. Um, there are, um, let's have a look. There are two or three, if I try and group them together, um, one of them is personally addressed to both of you. Hey, Clara and Mohammed, did you think in your undergrad days that you'd be doing your PhD at CERN? Um, another one, how many PhD students does CERN take um, each year on average? And then I think uh, there are another question here from Alfredo saying, what's the admission percentage of students or engineers that apply to work at CERN? And what kind of marks do you need as a student to apply to CERN? So, uh, Perhaps you could kind of address generally your paths to get to where you are today and how, what kind of education you needed, what kind of choices you need to make along the way and the application processes. Yeah, um, so I, I can start. So I, um, I, I'll be honest, I went to uh, what's called a state school in the United Kingdom uh, and my school struggled. So I didn't go to the best school in the UK. I mean, they worked really hard with the students, but the average grades were not really high. Um, so the, the number of students from my school that went to university was not very high. So first of all, my goal was to get to university. So I, I studied physics and math and English uh, and chemistry to, to get into university. Um, and then when I, I went to Manchester, I, I didn't have the best grades. I mean, they were they were good. I had to work for them, but um, I didn't have like the very, very highest grades. Because in my opinion, to be an experimental physicist, you really need to have, um, you need to think about things and work through problems. And it's not always about being able to pass the exam. You want to show enthusiasm. You want to show that you're interested in the project. You might read around it. Um, and really, if, that, if you want to come work at CERN, having that kind of enthusiasm, learning about the detector, going to meet professors, um, and, and, and trying to yeah, see if you can work on a project, I think would really get you uh, in, in a good place to be able to work here. So yeah, as an undergrad, I didn't imagine that I, I would be here <laughs> working uh, on the Atlas detector. I actually did my master's project at um, another experiment in Chicago at Fermilab. So that one's called D-Zero, and I was just so I mean, they, they assigned us the project and we got to work on the data, but at the end of the year, they said, do you want to keep working on this experiment? And we'll send you to Chicago and you can go and 
work in the lab and get that experience. And I was just, I don't even think they finished the question before I said yes. Fermi, um, Fermi Lab's another great lab, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, sister lab over there, brilliant. Yeah, so it was a really wonderful place to, uh, to learn about being a particle physicist and meet really interesting colleagues. And a lot of those colleagues now that Fermi Lab is moving to work on neutrinos um, have come to CERN to work on the experiments here. So the connections of the people I, I met with. Um, yeah, and so maybe to answer the question, uh, and then I'll hand over to Mohammed. The number of PhD students that are working for CERN. Um, so I think in Atlas, for example, we have about, I, I think about two to two and a half thousand PhD students. So almost half of our collaboration is made up of, of PhD students who are, who are training, but they are doing vital work for the experiment. This experiment would not work without their contribution. So I don't want people to think that PhD students are, are just learning. I mean, they do have a lot of learning to do, but they're doing work that's so important. Um, but mostly they're selected by the universities and the institutes from Atlas. So it's not Atlas or CERN themselves that select the majority of the students. So if you're interested in coming to work here and you're before university, pick a university that is a member of one of the collaborations of CERN because that will already give you an opportunity in your undergraduate to be able to, um, to, to do some experience. If you can't do that, and a lot of places can't, I completely understand, try and become a CERN summer student. So talk to your professors and see if they can um, help you get on the CERN summer student program. And that's another fantastic way to get experience here as an undergrad. Do you want to talk about your uh, path? Yeah, so Okay. I speak, I speak about myself. So okay. I did my bachelor degree in physics. I applied uh, for master's degree in Europe, but I found myself doing theoretical particle physics. And I heard about CERN at the end of my master's degree because I decided to do experimental physics, not theoretical physics. So let's say, I mean, I never, never heard or I imagined to work at CERN. I didn't know about it. I knew about CERN lab. And yes, after, my, after I finished my master's degree, a professor at the ICT International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy asked me to join his uh, newly established uh, experimental group. Uh, okay, I agreed. For which experiment? Atlas. So I learned about CERN and Atlas. And then later I uh, did my PhD in Bonn uh, on Atlas experiment. And I came 10 years ago to CERN. I'm still here. So, I mean, okay, I'm going to throw in one question really fast here because I think we're, we're really running out of time. We've got two minutes left, but it's a very interesting one. Has particle physics done anything for the fight against COVID-19? Yep. Do you want me to answer this? Very quickly. Yeah, so uh, I, I haven't been involved in those teams, but I know, for example, that at the start, a lot of... Um, so labs and CERN itself donated like personal protective equipment that we have um, to the local hospital. So the very first thing they did was ensure that the, the, the equipment that we usually use in our clean rooms was donated to medical users. But then scientists and engineers started working on developing um, ventilators, which are very cheaply made, really um, low cost ventilators that can be made um, for uh, Sort of developing countries that can't afford necessarily um, to buy the very expensive ventilators. They produce visors um, to, to wear. So the, the team, you know, we're used to working on complicated problems and designing very complicated equipment very in, in short amounts of time. So the, the team took the challenge to, to contribute against the fight for the, the against the COVID-19. Absolutely. That's fantastic to hear. I didn't think you'd all be sitting around uh, watching Netflix. I'm, I'm glad you're <laughs> doing some amazing stuff. Uh, it's time to end this first event of the day's Big Bang stage uh, programme. I want to say a big thank you to Mohammed and Clara for spending their afternoon underground with us. Um, no and everybody out there, thank you for all your questions. Come back in about 10 minutes because we have some something quite magical coming up the world premiere of the film A Day in Particles. Goodbye. Bye-bye.